So here we are. Uh, see, I want to say show 12, and it's uh, the 16th episode of Jefferson 101. It's going to be the longest biography in human history before well, we're done. You know, if people hate it, they'll let us know, right? I love it because it allows me out of character to kind of resynthesize my views of Jefferson. I read everything I possibly can on Jefferson. I, I know, love you, it because you read he, a great deal. I, I do, and, and the farther we get into this, the more I read and— uh, but then I get to come back to you and find out if I'm interpreting it properly. I, there was a couple different books, um, and they're, they're, I think they're both uh, online for very cheap or maybe even free. Um, one was the uh, uh, Sarah Randolph. Oh, the domestic like of, of Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, and the other one was uh, American Apostle. Do you know this book? No, you have been mentioning it to me though. Yeah, and by uh, Slade, is that his name? No, Chenard, I think. Oh no, the Apostle of Americanism. Right. By Chenard, is a right. French scholar. Right. He wrote several books on Jefferson, but Thomas Jefferson, Apostle of Americanism. Both of them have their warts, but they're both uh, they're great fun. No, they're and they're now with the digital revolution, there are literally hundreds of books about Jefferson that are essentially free that you can get online and either download or, or read on a device and so on. So it's a great time for Jefferson studies because the average person for less money has more access to more than ever before. And the other one that um, I was really excited about, in fact, I, I made you read a couple pages of it today, um, is uh, Liberty's First Crisis by uh, an author named Charles Slack. Oh, Slack. Yeah, and I'm hoping that you uh, Charles Slack. Yeah, I'm hoping that you get a chance to read that. I'll then, download it tonight on my yeah, iPad. It's it's it's, uh, it's, it's uh, it was written a couple of years ago, if I'm reading this right, and it's incredibly contemporary. I think the most important thing that we say in this program about Jefferson's time at Monticello between 1794 and 1797, after which he becomes vice president, and so on is that he really meant that this was his final retirement. He could not know that he would wind up being the third president of the United States. He could not know that he would be the vice president for He's John Adams. Done. He Going thought home for he good. thought that he was burned out. He was disillusioned. He thought that the that the Hamiltonians had gotten control of the country and that our republic was in some danger. He decided to return to quote unquote my country, meaning Virginia and bury himself in intellectual projects and in gardening and farming. Little did he know, and I don't think he could have anticipated, and I don't think he would have wanted this to happen. Little did he know that in just three years, the people of the United States would narrowly avoid making him president, but make him the runner-up and therefore vice president, and that four years after that, because of the Quasi War and the Adams administration's mishandlings of almost everything, uh, especially the alien and sedition laws, Jefferson would be propelled into the highest office of the United States where for eight long years he would serve as the third president and only then retire. But even then, he retires in 1809. Now he's really an old man in his mind. And yet, my friend, he has 17 more years. One thing in the show that you talked about was you felt like it was the Jay Treaty that had a lot to do with drawing him back into the political and world. And creating the two-party system. But um, one of the things that I came across was him going into, I don't know if it would have been Richmond or Charlottesville, probably Charlottesville, but going to a tavern and writing about um, the local townspeople had no idea what was going on in Philadelphia, and we're kind of ambivalent about it. Until the Industrial Revolution, until really after the Civil War, most Americans had no connection with government. And I'm wondering how that would have affected Jefferson. Would that have made him think, well, yeah, I'm doing the right thing, just stay out of it? Or would it have made him think, i got to get back into this? No, I think just the former. I think he would have thought <laughs> they don't even know What's out there? So I'm, I'm out there beating why, my Why am I on, doing yeah, this yeah. when my happiness is here, misery was there, my family is here, Hamilton is there, and the people that I'm trying to do this on behalf of are leading profoundly local lives, and that's okay. It's okay that they're leading profoundly local lives because you know what? The issues of government don't really matter. What matters is family and farming and books and life. He writes about that. I'm going to have to find that because— 
uh, I, I really wanted to hear. I want you to dissect that. Maybe next time. Let's huh? do so. I want to. I want to really get to the in the next program to this very interesting letter that he wrote to his daughter Maria years later, in right. which he said, "You know, that might have been a mistake that retirement because I started to become misanthropic. I became moody. I became melancholic. We, you know, man is a social creature. We need to stay current with the world. And I would hope you won't do what I did, which is kind of turn off from the world because I got through it, but it it actually didn't serve me very well in the end. I think that's one of the most revealing and important letters in in Jefferson's life. He loved rural life, but you know what? Monticello was a long, long, long way from anything. And even though he wrote 10, 12 letters a day and read all these books, he needed to be with like-minded people, and Madison was just not there enough. So let's listen. Let's listen to Jefferson 101, episode 16, Jefferson's first retirement between 1794 and and 1797. Thanks, everyone, for your support. Keep listening. Tell everyone you know. And if you're so disposed, you can join the famous 1776 Club. We'll see you soon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, brought to you by Bismarck State College on the banks of the Missouri River at the heart of the Lewis and Clark Trail. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson, when he is here, is portrayed by the gentleman seated across from me, the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and good to see you, Mr. Jenkinson. My friend, it's great to see you. Happy New Year. We're in 2017. We have a new president of the United States. We do, and uh, we also have done something we promised to do, which is return to the Jefferson 101 series. In fact, sir, we are up to show number 16. We are about to retire Jefferson. He thought for the last time, it turns out that was not true. This is beginning in December 1793 and January of 1794. He left his post as the Secretary of State in the Washington administration, went back to Monticello and thought that he would remain there forever. Just to back up and catch up, the the last two shows that we did in the Jefferson 101 series dealt with his time as Secretary of State, a fascinating period, really, but a tough one for Jefferson. Tough period for Jefferson. He thought that Washington was going to make him the principal secretary, in a certain sense, the assistant president. And he thought that the duties would not be onerous. And he thought that it would be a harmonious administration. And it turned out that none of those things were true. If you have missed any of these earlier Jefferson 101 programs, you can find them all at jeffersonhour.com, along with ways to support the show, the 1776 Club. We are listener-supported. We're very proud of that and very grateful to those of you who have decided to support the show in that way. But looking at where we're going today, I guess we'd call it Jefferson's first retirement. He'd been Secretary of State, gone through a pretty tough time. Right. And in the summer of 1793... He went to President Washington and said, I want to resign. Can you, can you tell us about that? Jefferson had tried a couple of previous times to withdraw. He did not like being in the Washington administration. He felt that his he was getting older, that why waste your time in a world where your views are not respected or, uh, or adopted? He couldn't stand Hamilton. He was dis- imp- disappointed with George Washington. He, he, felt, he felt futile. And he felt deeply frustrated, and he felt that the American dream was slipping away from the National Republic. And so he just really wanted to, to go home. His, his, his attitude, this is sort of a key to the character of Jefferson, and he said this in a letter to Abigail, Adam, Abigail Adams. He said, I, I don't like to fight. I don't, I don't want to be in the arena. I don't want to be a gladiator. I don't want strife. My, my bent, my character, when there's trouble— is to withdraw, quietly to withdraw, to go home, to plant rutabagas, uh, to write letters, to read books, to ride my horse, to know my children and grandchildren. And he said, I don't have the spirit of somebody who wants to be a political gladiator. And, and so can I just can I just let me go? And Washington wouldn't do it. Washington had a point. When Washington became the first president, he was very reluctant to do so. Then, in the middle of 
his first term, Hamilton and Jefferson and Madison and others pressed him to accept a second term. Washington really didn't want to do that. But they said, oh, the country will fall apart. It's too fresh. It hasn't, it hasn't been set yet that if you don't stay long enough for some real habits of decorum and presidential leadership to establish themselves, the whole experiment could crumble. And so pressed by everybody around him to stay for a second term, Washington said, all right, well, if I have to, I have to. Uh, the country is more important than I am. And then he, he looks around and there's Jefferson trying to sneak away. And he thinks, wait a minute, if, if you all pressed me to stay on as president for the good of the country, then why do you get to go home when the going gets rough? You have to stay with me and serve out your time. So he was actually pretty upset with Jefferson for withdrawing. And then a year later, Hamilton did. He was out of money. He had a growing family. He needed to get back to New York. And so Hamilton left before Washington's second term was over. Yeah, I, I think it's important to once again reflect on how volatile these times really were. When you read about that period, the uh, the, the fights going on between the, the emerging two parties, the, the backroom dealings, uh, the wars and the press, you, you can't really blame Jefferson for wanting to get away from that, or, or can you? Well, there are several levels here. One is Jefferson's dreaminess. So he is a visionary, a utopian visionary. And he's dreaming of this ideal agrarian republic straight out of the pages of the poet Virgil or Horace, a kind of a never-never a, a land of farmers who read Homer in the original Greek but are on jury duty and step up to be a people's militia but live in this wonderful harmony and are entirely self-governing. That world never existed. That world probably never can exist. And Jefferson's, his, his susceptibility to that Virgilian dream of the farmer Republican patriot, Cincinnatus, that bugged other people, especially people like Hamilton who were hard-headed pessimists and realists. But it bugged everyone because everyone knew that Jefferson was Basically, living in this fairy tale land. Well, wait a minute now. You know, I, I have to, to I have to say to you that in in going through the period of um, him being Secretary of State in the previous uh, Jefferson One Hundred and One episodes, and reading about that, um, you know how it is. You kind of get rebirthed into more Jefferson periodically. Yes. And I think both of us are really going through a period a of deeper that. Jefferson. Yeah. Um, but I began to understand for the first time in all these years of talking with you how important Jefferson's vision was. I mean, the, the, the discussion about how he looked at, at America during that time as mankind's perhaps last great chance to govern himself in liberty. And, and how can you not be um, discouraged when people don't recognize that? I mean, I, I really, I began to understand that and see why he was so disgusted with Hamilton. Agreed. I mean, you, you, so when you say... You nailed you know, it. His fairy tale. I'm kind of the bristles. Of well, but but it. but my second point is so so that's so there's this kind of utopian Jefferson, and it really did bug almost everybody. Then there's the second Jefferson, and that's the one you just articulated, who said, no matter what's the case, this is humankind's best chance to live in enlightenment, to live according to reason, to cooperate, to tolerate, to use science as their oracle. This is humanity's best chance in the history of the planet to get it right. Don't you think those two Jeffersons were one, though? Well, they 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 were porous. They well, kind of well, flowed in and fed, out of each other. Fed the other, yes. almost. Yeah. But but even if you made him more pragmatic, if you said, "Look, Jefferson, it's not Virgil's world. You're not you're not going to have farmers reading Homer in the original Greek. Face it." He'd say, oh, "All right, fair enough." But even so, we have a chance to vindicate the human project by getting it right for the first time ever, and we mustn't succumb to the darkness and the power politics and the real politic and the greed that's being espoused by people like Hamilton. So he believed it strenuously. And when he saw that Hamilton was basically this sort of monarchical militarist outlier, uh, the, 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 the beginning of the, of the speculative capitalist phase of American history, that upset him. He never really thought Hamilton was one of us, though. He never really thought that Hamilton was 
was a real American. He always thought that he was kind of like a, an alien. But when he saw that Hamilton usually won the battles by persuading Washington and that Jefferson's more idealistic view of America, Washington admired but would not accept that Washington, hearing both possibilities, generally speaking, gravitated towards Hamilton's realism against Jefferson's idealism, that in a way broke Jefferson's heart because Hamilton didn't matter to him except insofar as he was so good at what he did. But Washington did matter to Jefferson and, and he looked to Washington as the savior of the human project. And when Washington became a kind of quasi-Hamiltonian, Jefferson took it very badly. He was resentful. He tended to blame Hamilton for all of this. But to blame Hamilton for all this, he had to pretend to himself that Washington was malleable or senile or at least not what he once was. And so Jefferson sort of eases his way into thinking, well, the old man is a great man, but he's not quite what he once was. But, but don't you think a little bit is sort of careful what you wish for? I mean, they, they went through the revolution and they achieved independence – which provided liberty for one and all. And we have, granted, Washington's not a king. He's not a monarchist, but he is an aristocrat. He is that 1%. And it was that 1% that was ruling the country because they knew better. They thought they did. I, I find it somewhat ironic. I mean, the, the Revolutionary War was fought to ensure that all men were created equal, and all of a sudden what John Adams might call the rabble were equal status or tried to be. Um, how did they react to that? They all talked a good game about the people as sovereign and self-government and so on. But it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to believe it or to achieve it. And so part of this was revolutionary rhetoric. But when these elites like John Jay and George Washington and John Adams and James Monroe and so on actually contemplated the people being sovereign and asserting themselves and governing themselves without an intermediary elite. Those people turned out not to be Democrats at heart. They they wanted to talk rhetorically about the rights of man and, and people as sovereign, but they actually liked to control the destiny of the United States, and they didn't really trust the mob, you know, the, 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 the average person on the street. They thought that that person was ignorant. And, so what and, you're saying is it sort of devolved into this black and white, do you want the mob, do you want the monarchy? I'm sure neither one of them was correct, but then again... But the Jeffersonians didn't... They but they didn't the believe it. They didn't call it a mob. Jefferson believed it was the people. But even John Adams thought, really? I mean, have you looked around? Because the people, you know, they're, they're gross and ignorant and they gouge each other's eyes out and drink unbelievable quantities of Applejack. And this is not a pretty picture, Mr. Jefferson. Well, you, you hear the music, which means that it's time for us to take a short break. If you're just joining us, we're into the Jefferson 101 series, and really, when we come back, I think we'll start at 1794 with Mr. Jefferson's return to Monticello. Jefferson's disillusioned. He's heading home. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and we'll be back in just a moment. Hello, everyone. I'm Clay Jenkinson, inviting you to join me for a cultural tour of John Steinbeck's California, March 4th through 10th, 2017. You know, over the years, I've been able to put together these retreats at Loxaw Lodge and tours of Jefferson's Virginia and so on, and I have always wanted to examine the California that produced one of America's greatest novelists, John Steinbeck. I'm most eager to take you to Steinbeck's boyhood home, to the tide pools that he explored with his friend Ed Ricketts, to Monterey, to Route 66. Each day will begin with a conversation about John Steinbeck's works. But then we'll walk where he walked, hike in the mountains of California, look at Salinas and Monterey and all of the scenes that inspired, in some sense, America's most extraordinary novelist. This retreat is hosted by my friend Becky Cowley of Odyssey Tours. And for more information, visit jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours. We'll see you in Steinbeck's America. 
Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week we're talking about Jefferson's retirement with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And I said we were going to begin in uh, 1794. January, he arrives back at Monticello. And I, I think, you know, you had talked earlier about, uh, you know, he was tired. He was worn out. I mean, and you, you pointed this out in an earlier show that, I mean, he, did, he didn't have much of a staff. He did all the business of, of the Office of Secretary of State pretty much by himself. Well, a couple of clerks. So he had to worry about all the details of foreign and domestic affairs, even had to translate documents, do reports for the president. So, I mean, it wasn't like he was sitting around and telling people. He was His hands were in it, and he was... He was worn out. He wasn't going to afternoon receptions and then dinner parties and taking leisurely horseback rides. Jefferson was working flat out. Jefferson had a genius for hard work and administration, but he says in letters from the retirement period, he says, you have no idea how hard I worked. I couldn't respond to personal letters. I couldn't read books. I couldn't engage in scientific activities. I was just working. And so you get this picture. I don't think he's exaggerating of a man who got up at dawn and basically worked flat out all day long with just breaks for meals and maybe a quick horseback ride, did not have leisurely evenings. He was worn down by the sheer quantity of labor. He was extremely conscientious all of his life. And, as you say, he felt the labor was in vain because it it, it was not winning the support of Washington, and he had an active antagonist, Hamilton, who essentially disagreed with everything Jefferson said or did, maybe on principle, but but it looks also like he just agreed, disagreed with Jefferson because he hated Jefferson. He just didn't <laughs> like Jefferson and wanted to destroy him. And so the, he, Jefferson and Hamilton get into this, I guess you'd call it a passive aggressive long-term quarrel in which they're they can't trust each other. They, they're they prejudiced against each other's pronouncements. They have a kind of a glacial, formal relationship where they say, my dear sir and Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Hamilton, but it's clear that the tension is just through the roof and Washington can't stand it. He wants harmony. And Washington just wants good government. And his view is sort of Rodney King. Why can't you two just get along? You know, we're all we're all trying to create the same stable and reasonably prosperous republic here, gentlemen. They both wanted Washington's attention and affection and respect. And Jefferson was the one who lost more than Hamilton. Washington loved Hamilton in a way that he never loved Jefferson. And he respected Hamilton's views, even though he didn't always intuitively agree with them. And he did see Jefferson as sort of a visionary utopian in some respects. So Jefferson's had enough and he goes home. And he, 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 when he goes home in 1794, he's still a very young man. He's in his 50s. He thinks, that's it. I am never coming out of retirement. I am now a country gentleman. I'll write a book maybe or read a lot of books. I'll correspond with my friends. I'll, I'll, he wants to rebuild Monticello. So, the, so one of the first things Jefferson does when he gets home is assess his finances and realizes that he's already deeply in trouble economically. And he, so he refinances all these notes and does what he can to get stable. Then he realizes that the farms have deteriorated, that the land is eroded, that the overseers have not been efficient, that his slaves are not efficient, that his his agricultural life is in some disarray. And then, this is so Jefferson, in the midst of these things, which are pretty serious issues, he decides to rebuild Monticello because while he was in Europe, he saw neoclassical buildings, including in Paris, the Hotel de Somme with its dome. And so he decides to tear down his already expensive brick mansion and rebuild it along these French neoclassical lines. So he's spending money that he doesn't have in organizing gangs of slaves to bake bricks and cut timbers and tear down walls and build mortar and do all of this stuff. He's busy, but he's penniless, essentially. You know, I I did some research trying to find out, you know, his debts. I'm not sure how much or can you shed light on that? Well, I've I've got details on that. It's not worth going into great detail because it's a bit tedious, but but 
but I can tell you in broad outlines that Jefferson inherited debt with his father-in-law's estate. So his father-in-law, John Wales, was a prosperous man with a lot of slaves and a lot of property, but he had not managed his affairs very well. And so when Jefferson's father-in-law dies, he inherits thousands of acres, many of them where his home Poplar Forest would be built in Bedford, near today's Lynchburg, and 135 slaves, which is a gigantic number of slaves. His own um, slave community was 52, and suddenly he inherits 135 slaves overnight, including, by the way, the Hemings family. And he discovers, as soon as he starts to take charge of his father-in-law's inheritance, that much of it is mortgaged and indebted, and Jefferson owes an enormous amount of money just to clear John Wales' debts. So he sells off some of the land and refinances other things. He never really got out from under that. I mean, all of the books agree that Jefferson, yes, he spent more than he took in, and Jefferson was extravagant, and Jefferson had really extraordinary high taste. What you're saying, this period was the beginning of that. That's where it all started? He realizes during this period that there's no easy way out from under the whale's debt and that unless he has perfect crops and goes on on an economic diet of great severity, he is probably not going to extricate himself from this inherited debt. If Jefferson had never inherited the whale's property— he probably would have done better in life than he did. He had a false sense of being wealthy when he inherited all of that. Oh, really? But it wasn't wasn't free of debt. And so there's another piece to this. So Jefferson paid John Wales' debts using currency that was accepted during the American Revolution. He paid it, and it was a sacrifice. When the peace treaty came in 1783... The specie, the currency that had been used to pay those debts was repudiated in the peace treaty. So now Jefferson has to pay again what he's already paid. (laughs) So he's paid most of these debts off. The peace treaty, the British do not accept that form of payment. And so now Jefferson has lost all this ground. He he had sacrificed to pay off those debts. Now the, the peace treaty has said that didn't count. Start over. And so now he has to find a way to service that debt in, that debt load. It's it's an almost impossible situation from which he never was entirely free for the rest of his life. But he was quite happy when he went back to Monticello in 1794, and he, he his migraines stopped. He did some he did some good things. He, this, he that's when he started his crop rotation. His he, nail factory and inventing of the plow, which I think is really the re, interesting. The rebuilding of Monticello. Um, he accumulated more in his library. He gardened. He experimented. And this was a great period for Jefferson's life because he really was a kind of a gifted amateur, almost a dilettante genius who had his hands in many different things and loved to putter about and do grids and graphs and invent things and redesign things and reorganize things and classify and count and try rotation systems and work on the plow that he had designed while he was in Europe. So this is great. He finally is free from all of these oppressive public burdens. And there's great letters that he wrote. He says, I don't subscribe to newspapers anymore. I don't even write letters really much. I just do when it's rainy. I'm out in my fields. I, I'm like an antediluvian from the Old Testament with my with my children and my grandchildren and my and my orchards. So he's it's sort of an idyll. It's sort of this magical agrarian time in his life. But the debts and family issues. So you know those. I mean, there are two. Uh, his daughter Martha was married to Thomas Mann Randolph. Thomas Mann Randolph's father. Colonel Randolph was a widower, and he married a woman younger than his own children and favored his new family and was incredibly hard on his son, Thomas Mann Randolph, and in certain ways stripped economic opportunity away from his son, Thomas Mann Randolph, to give it to his new family with the young woman that he married. And this was very upsetting to Thomas Mann Randolph and to his wife, Martha. And then secondly— 
There was the incident at the plantation called Bazaar. What a well-named plantation. I looked that up. Do you know what that comes from? No. Um, well, nobody knows how it was named, but it, it uh, in French, Bazaar originally meant valorous. Valorous. Uh-huh. So Jefferson's daughter Martha is married to Thomas Mann Randolph, whose sister Nancy goes to live with her sister and her sister's husband, Richard Randolph. A young thing, not yet 20. So this young woman, this young impressionable woman, Nancy Randolph. Quite good looking, turned up nose. Single. Goes to live with her sister and brother-in-law. Immediately people said she was too fond of him. She got pregnant by him, which is a scandal and of course a terrible betrayal of her sister. We don't know quite what happens next. She either has the child or she doesn't. She either had a miscarriage or she gave birth to a live child. They went to, I want to say, Glentivar Another Another plantation. To visit cousins. Where she has her lying in, whatever it is, and either gives birth or has a miscarriage. And so Richard Randolph, her lover, her sister's husband, disposes of somehow. And so there are bloody sheets, and you can imagine, but there's no baby. So either it was a miscarriage and the evidence was gotten rid of because it's adulterous and it's not only adulterous but betrayal of her own sister or there's a baby born that's killed. He is then charged with infanticide. When they arrived at the house, it was under construction. There was a pile of shingles out front and field hands the next day reported finding blood and tissue. So he's then arrested and indicted for infanticide. And guess who, guess who serves as his defense attorneys? Patrick Henry and John Marshall, uh, both enemies to Jefferson, by the way. And so he's acquitted. There's no real evidence. Slaves can't testify in courts. So he's acquitted, but the scandal doesn't end. Jefferson, so his daughter Martha writes to Jefferson and says, Father, this horrible thing, our reputation will be destroyed. This is such a scandal. Everyone's talking about it. I mean, this taints us. And Jefferson writes one of the great letters of his life in which he says, look, this doesn't touch you. And he said, in addition to that, this young poor woman, Nancy, either in error or a victim, he said, she has never needed friendship and love more than she needs at this moment. He said, now is the time that you should turn towards her rather than away from her. She needs love now. You cannot allow your outrage and your shame to get in the way of your duty to reach out to her. And amazing. This is Jefferson yeah. at his absolute best. best. Yeah, yeah. And so, but he, and then Jefferson blames Richard, the, the husband and the seducer, but he says, this is all him. You know, the, it was the courtly tradition of, of Virginia Cavaliers to blame the male. Anyway, this goes away. I mean, he, he was right that these things will pass. We don't. We weren't there. We don't know exactly what's going on here, but Nancy needs your support, and so that's how that story ends. But my point is that the Jefferson story, you know, he always presents life in Virginia as this sort of wonderful pastoral thing, but it's also Peyton Place. You know, it's also this crazy world of sexual intrigue and father son struggles and. A grown man marrying a woman younger than his youngest children, and it's it's the world that actually exists. But Jefferson wants to see it as something much more pastoral and noble and innocent and beautiful, and he willfully pursues that path in in spite of the evidence of the dysfunction in his family. And of course, we haven't even mentioned the dysfunction of slavery, which was also a besetting problem of that pastoral world. You see my point? I do. Um, there are some wonderful pieces of correspondence that appear during this period. You know, one of the questions to me is, um, well, did he really want to retire? And I have an answer to that. I do too. Oh, let's hear yours. From the written accounts of both friends of his and things that he wrote, there's no doubt he wanted to be done, in my mind. We agree 100%. You know, people like John Adams— 
said, well, you know, he's honeycombed with ambition. This is just a, this is a, a demagogic posturing that he's pretending to retire so that the country draws him back. And He wrote this letter to James Madison that I, I mentioned earlier, part of the, part of the lines. About it. He writes, uh, age, experience, and reflection preserving to that only its due value have set a higher on tranquility. The motion of my blood no longer keeps time with the tumult of the world. I love that. I think you know. I I think I've read all this again now, preparing for this program, and I've been I've been in these debates with my former student Joanne Freeman and others who are cynics about Jefferson, and they think that this whole sort of pastoral thing. I'm going to go home. I just want to be with my orchards and my grandchildren. They think that that's that is a political pose, a kind of a Machiavellian pose of the of the of the agrarian Roman Republican from the ancient world. I disagree. I, I agree with you, David. You can't read the correspondence about this without, I think, coming to believe that Jefferson meant it with all of his heart, that he was oppressed by the political world of Philadelphia, that he really wanted to be a country gentleman and a scientist, and that that these are very sincere letters about his preference for the tranquility outside of the world of tumult. And I don't see how anyone can read that correspondence, frankly, and not see how sincere and intense Jefferson's pastoral desires are. And it's not only him. It's um, uh, firsthand accounts from others who visited him. And he gets a chance. You know, uh, he, Edmund Randolph, the Secretary of State, writes him and says, Washington wants to send you to Spain as a distinguished diplomat. This would be a great thing. You should do it. You and you alone have the capacity to do it because of the distinguished work you did as Secretary of State. And Jefferson says, no, never, nothing, nothing, nothing will ever tempt me again to leave Monticello and to go back into the arena. Is, that's the one where he writes, I think it is Montaigne who has said that ignorance is the softest pillow on which a man can lay his head. Yeah, he says that many times in the course of his life. And, I, you know, I really I really respect Jefferson for this. And do you know what happened during that period when he was home, that, that three-year period, 1794 to 97, when he becomes vice president? He made only one journey from Monticello, one and one only, and that was to Richmond early during that time. Uh, you, you had mentioned that. And I, Never I, I other, no that. other journey anywhere but one. So for a period of years, he was at Monticello period. And, that and was maybe it. goes into Charlottesville to get the mail. But he is at Monticello and he thinks this is it. He thinks for the rest of his biological life, how, however long that might be, he is going to be Thomas Jefferson, the former Secretary of State, the former ambassador to France, and the author of the Declaration of Independence, now living in philosophical retirement at his mountain estate in Western Virginia. That turns out, of course, not to be true. Yeah, a, a source for me, and I hope you'll tell me it's an okay one, um, I found was a, a book, The Domestic Life of Thomas Jefferson by Sarah Randolph. That, that's his granddaughter. Which you, I should say to listeners that um, I mean, you can get it online for a buck, I think, maybe free. It's a very interesting book. It's letters and accounts. A wonderful book. And the granddaughters are just amazing. He loved his granddaughter. It's great. Say, you know. my, I, she said, I just kind of whispered that I needed a guitar and then... Lo and behold, there was a guitar, and my first party dress came from. <laughs> so my So you would agree with me that this is a good, good if, primer into. If Jefferson's you want to know letters. Thomas Jefferson, read the domestic life of Thomas Jefferson. It's uh -huh. magnificent. It's great fun, and he's such, he's such a marvelous human being. You know, we forget that because we're talking about slavery and politics and the French Revolution and the Louisiana Purchase and so on, the embargo, but. Jefferson himself thought he was the person that his granddaughter is writing about, this, this country gentleman who loves science and books. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're into the Jefferson 101 series, talking about his retirement to Monticello in 1794. We're going to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment.
Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about President Thomas Jefferson. This week we're speaking with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, and we are revisiting, as promised, the Jefferson 101 series. I believe this is episode 16, and we're talking about the period of Jefferson's life in 1794 when he left the government and went home to enjoy life at Monticello. It was a very interesting part of his life, and and when we go to Monticello today and we see the magnificent dome and the Palladian structure of the thing, that is post-France. Jefferson, before that, had a two-story portico, a very different sort of house. You can see it online or in any book about Monticello. When he was in France, he fell in love with the dome. Historians believe it might have been the first dome in the United States. It's certainly among the first, and it became the characteristic Monticello of the nickel and the $2 bill and one of the most beautiful private homes ever built in the United States. But that that rebuilding started but was not finished during this three-year period in which he was in retirement. There's a letter that I know you know of, a French duke. The Duc de la Rochefoucauld. Uh, June of 1796. And it, uh, yeah, I found that really interesting because it's a firsthand account about his day-to-day life and what kind of a guy he was. Give us a piece of it. In private life, Mr. Jefferson displays a mild, easy, and obliging temper, though he is somewhat cold and reserved. His conversation is of the most agreeable kind, and he possesses a stock of information not inferior to that of any other man. In Europe, he would hold a distinguished rank among men of letters. And it's really interesting that he says cold and reserved. I think he means private and protective. Perhaps a bit of an aristocrat, standoffish. But almost everybody who met Jefferson reports on this, that at first there's a reserve. It's almost um, a chill. And you're not even sure you want to be with Jefferson because he's not, he's not warm and inviting. But everyone who knew Jefferson says if you can get through that, if, he's, if he realizes that you have things to say, that you have ideas, that you're a scientist, that you've read books, that you, that you understand something about the, the history of the world or know something about political theory or know something about agriculture or parrots or South America. But if you are interesting – and you and you exhibit that you you too are a, a man of curiosity and wide intellectual interests. Jefferson warms up to you, and then it's as if you've known each other all of your lives. And he says, "Get another bowl of punch and try a little of this wine. And won't you stay another day? I want to show you something in in my fields. Maybe you could stay long enough for us to go to the Natural Bridge. It's worth a trip across the Atlantic. But you have to get through the the initial." Reserve and that, David. That's what led some people to believe that Jefferson may have had a touch of Asperger's. That there is kind of a, a, a disconnect or a there's something there, and you have to get through that in order to know him. Huh. Um, he goes on in the letter to say, at present, he is employed with activity and perseverance in the management of his farms and buildings, and he orders, directs, and pursues in the minutest details every branch of business relative to them. Yeah, it drove Jefferson crazy to have to live with the uncertainties of agriculture. You know, he, he's a man of precision. Every book is in its place. He has a tripartite classification system based on Lord Bacon. He's keeping these daily diaries. He's taking down the temperature twice a day. Jefferson wants order, certainty, routine, precision. And when he turns to agriculture, he has to deal with weevils and The Hessian fly, and it had to be so frustrating for him because he wanted everything. He wanted breakfast at the same minute every day. He wanted to wake up at the same minute every day. He wanted to bathe his feet in in cold water. And so uncertainty always undid him, and he, he couldn't control agriculture because it's going to hail. You're going to have a late frost. You're going to have an early frost. Things that are beyond the capacity of humans to manage are central to the life of a farmer. He says in the letter, and this again goes with Jefferson and the independent farmers, uh, as he could not expect any assistance from the two small neighboring towns, every article is made on his farm. It's a small agricultural village. And he that, it's during this period that he started the nail factory because he thought, I'm never going to get out from under the debt. 
I have to find another economic enterprise. I can't depend merely on agriculture. Well, as North Dakotans, we know that this is like one of the mottos of the farm. There has to be a second form of economic stability for a farm to work under most circumstances. So he decides it's, it's Adam Smith capitalism. There's a need for nails, iron nails, including at Monticello. I'll start a little nail factory. I can buy nail rod. I'll have slave boys who aren't yet old enough to be out in the fields as full field workers make these nails. I'll provide incentives for them to profit a little bit yeah, from Yeah, he it. talks about that. He says uh, that his slaves are nourished, clothed, and treated as well as white servants. But he says he animates them by rewards and distinctions. <laughs> That's, so, it's, it's, a, it's a bit sad if it weren't horrible. He gives them special costumes. The nail maker of the week gets a special suit of clothes and other incentives for hard work. But But he thought, if I have a nail factory... I can maybe become solvent. And for, well, it was a pretty unique thing. For a couple of years, all, he was. All the nails had to come from Europe, right? Right. Pretty but, much. But then he was undercut by other nail producers in Britain, and that enterprise eventually failed. But, but it was one of his attempts to diversify his farm and get out from under the, the terrible burden of depending entirely for your income on agriculture. It was during this time that Sally Hemings had her first child. So he comes back from Europe in 1789. She may or may not have been pregnant then. That's a huge controversy in Jefferson studies. But if she was Jefferson's mistress or common law wife or whatever you want to call her for 34 years, she got pregnant during this period. She had maybe five children by and with Jefferson, maybe four, maybe miscarriages too. But Dumas Malone, who was the greatest of the Jefferson biographers, tried to disprove that any of this could have been true. And so he charted Jefferson's comings and goings, and he discovered to his horror that the pregnancies add up to the times that Jefferson was at Monticello. And so that it's more, he came away still adamantly um, skeptical about the Sally Hemings story, but he did admit that if you're looking for inception dates, the calendar and Jefferson's comings and goings do work with Sally Hemings' pregnancy cycles. But the first child that Sally Hemings had was born in December 1797. The first that we're sure of. And and died, I think, two years later? Right. So he, in his, in his farm book, one of his five daily diaries, Jefferson records all of this. And, you know, there was a European visitor who came and, and saw a white, or fair-skinned slaves out working in Jefferson's around the house and said, boy, they look a lot like Jefferson. But Jefferson's own family said he was unaware of this, that, I mean, he was like Mr. Magoo or something, that it had never even come to him, the thought that this could be a confusion or, in a sense, an indictment of his sexual behavior. So we get these strange reports. I don't think we should spend any more time on this except to say it does seem as if the Sally Hemming story is, has validity, but there are still many uncertainties about it. Except that somebody was impregnating slave women at Monticello, and that's that person was white, and somebody was a slave owner. Uh, although, <laughs> so was Washington, so was Madison, so was Monroe, so was Patrick Henry. You know, it's a long, dreary list, which doesn't justify anything. But but do, well, but it is worth knowing that eight of the first twelve presidents were slaveholders. So what I'm kind of looking to get into um, before we end this episode, which I suspect is going to spill into another one, as we talked prior to the show, it's it's such a rich period of Jefferson's life. There's so much, <laughs> every period of Jefferson's life becomes involved and rich. But there were things that happened in Philadelphia that sort of drew Jefferson back into the fray bit by bit. Is that fair to say? And, and the biggest of those, I don't know what you have in mind, but the biggest of those was the Jay Treaty with England. So John Jay was sent as a minister plenipotentiary to the court of St. James to try to work out some of the differences that had been unresolved after the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Th those differences were all based in economics. It was Americans really felt, and they were, the English were taking advantage. I mean, here we were, this new nation who had beaten Britain in a war, and Britain was beating us in the, in the trade war. Certain things had never been done. Britain had agreed in the Treaty of 1783 to withdraw from the Northwest fur and military forts, basically in the Great Lakes region. They never had. That was a huge irritant. 
Uh, Britain was supposed to pay southern planters for slaves that they had taken from the plantations to make reparations for what the southerners regarded as kidnapping, what the British regarded as liberating slaves the British had never had. The British said, wait a minute, uh, the Americans have never paid their war debts. They, they promised to do so. They have never compensated Tories adequately, as they promised to do during the peace treaty. So both sides accused the other of cheating. The British had tariffs that made, well, we were talking about nails, for instance. The British had tariffs that they manipulated that made things very difficult for American merchants. Did, isn't the, that true? The British economic system was mercantilist. That is, they, they believed that the, the official government policy of Britain was to support British economic industry. Britain first. And to discriminate against everybody else in order to aggrandize Britain, which is what most countries do to this day. Jefferson's view was, as, an, as a student of Adam Smith, he believed in international free trade. If we have a surplus of tobacco and you have a surplus of scarves, we'll trade them. That, it's, that the fewer tariffs, the fewer interventions by governments in the, in the global trading system, the better. Everyone prospers, according to Adam Smith and Jefferson. And so Jefferson, while he was the minister to France, is pushing for open markets and free trade. The French and the, the other European countries are not ready to do that, particularly Britain. And so Britain loses the war of independence to the United States and has to relinquish its 13 colonies. But it's, in a sense, it maintains uh, economic colonialism against those very colonies because the British have the only significant navy in the world. They have the biggest merchant marine. They're our big trading partner and so on. Oh, those foolish Americans will take well, care of this. Well, right? we'll just, I mean, we may they may be independent, but they still are dependent upon us economically, so we'll use that in our advantage, which, which I would do if I were Britain too. Isn't this kind of where the two-party system really took hold because you were either in favor of, of allying with the French or with the British? We had a permanent treaty of, of amity and cooperation with the French who had helped us win the War of Independence. When the French Revolution came, most Americans said, well, that was then and this is now. We, we're not dealing with these radicals. Our treaty no longer is valid. That was Hamilton's position. Jefferson's position was our treaty of friendship with France was not with the French government. It was with the French people. So the treaty is still in effect. So huge cabinet quarrel over that. And then... Hamilton's view was, and John Jay's too, when Jay went over to negotiate the treaty with Britain in 1794, their view was, look, yes, they're oppressive, and yes, they're not nice to us, and yes, they discriminate against us, but it's still in our interest to trade with them because they're our principal trading partner, and we're prospering. Maybe not, it's maybe not fair, but it works. And if we, if we cut our economic ties with Britain, they're going to enter into a much deeper trade war with us, or actual war, and we're not going to be able to make it up with trade on the continent. So, the best thing we can do is make the best of a, of a somewhat bad situation until such time as we get stronger as an economy and stronger as a nation, and then we'll be able to stand up to Britain and stand up for our own economic rights. When Jefferson hears that, he hears re-enslavement to Britain. Hamilton loves Britain more than he loves liberty. Hamilton has no, has no character. Hamilton is betraying the alliance with France. But wasn't there a period where... The, the majority of Mer Americans, uh, prior to the to the French Revolution getting so out of hand, that there was a majority of Americans who supported France over Britain? Yes, but that's like saying today, we can't stand our trade relationship with China. It may be true, but we're still in the trade relationship with China. We, we, we need what China can do for us. So, so, but your point was the right one, and that is that the two-party system as we know it grew out of this set of crises, and it was the Jay Treaty. Jay comes back with a treaty. Everyone thinks, ooh, this isn't really what we needed or had in mind. But the anti-Jay treaty people became the Jeffersonian Republicans. So that the first opposition party was born in an important way out of antagonism to the Jay Treaty and our continuing economic dependency on England and the administration's, Washington and Hamilton's and Jay's, willingness to accept that dependency. And that's what led Jefferson and Madison to say, all right, these people have to go. And that's what created the two-party system. So in the time we have left this week, sir, yes, sir, if we might, I'd like to take some time to uh, just do some business. What is that? Well, first of all, thank all of the listeners who have joined the 1776 Club to support the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We are listener supported and Tell them how much we appreciate that. Oh, it's 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 everything to us. You know, we are not corporate supported. 
we're not foundation supported. We're supported by listeners, as they say on NPR, listeners like you. And some of them belong to a special organization called the 1776 Club. There are special features, and we do some um, some call-ins. And and the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, you do cultural tours and have for... Many, many years. Many, many years. And there's a very special one coming up. This is the first time you have done one with John, John Steinbeck's Steinbeck, right? California. So 4 through March 10th this year, March 4 through 10th, 2017, we're going to be in Salinas, where he was born and raised, in Monterey, where he had his famous friendship with Ed Ricketts. We'll be all around that part of the of the California coast in some of the most beautiful country in the world, Carmel, Monterey, Salinas. And I'll be performing as Steinbeck. He's one of my characters. Steinbeck was one of America's principal novelists. The Grapes of Wrath is one of our top five books in the history of the United States. I love him. And this is a chance for me to take people who love literature and love Steinbeck and love the Jefferson Hour on a week-long trip through some of the most beautiful country in the world. Beautiful food, beautiful shelter, uh, great entertainment. And there's a, there's not a there's not a Wendover Death March, but there are a couple of hikes. And they won't even cause you to break a sweat, but you see vistas that Steinbeck saw, and they're amongst the most beautiful vistas in California. So that's March 4th through 10th. People can go to our website, jeffersonhour.org. And the first night you will be appearing as I will perform Mr. Steinbeck, being right? interviewed by long-term 1776 Club and Jefferson Hour friend and fan, uh, Mr. Russ Eagle, who's a, a, a who loves Steinbeck guy. more a than he loves guy. Jefferson. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so with that, sir, I think we're out of time for the week. Um, so where did we leave this? We're Jefferson. Gonna, we're going to start Jefferson 101, uh, episode 17, with the J Treaty, and you're going to explain us some of the how that all happened. And also, the the letter that Jefferson eventually wrote to his daughter Maria, saying that period of my life maybe was too alone and and it caused me to have some melancholy and I'm not I'm not sure I recommend retirement from the world in the way that I did it during that period ready to get back in the game right and it's a wonderful letter to his to his second daughter I just love these episodes it's so much fun to hear you talk about this I really I really do appreciate you and your encyclopedic knowledge oh my my friend we'll see you all next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson hour The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.